the true treasure in life is protected by dragons, by really scary stuff. Only people who are really willing to go into their fear deserve to find that treasure. You know, and artists always go in. It seems to me that the, the only difference between artists and creative people and so-called normal people, and there, there's no such thing, is that artists have a particular attitude to the unknown, which is positive. In other words, artists don't view or feel that the unknown is threatening. They actually are attracted to it and they dive into it and in, they embrace it because it's only by going into the unknown that you discover life and you discover the larger life beyond your preconceptions. So, especially when I teach, I stress this with my students, the importance of stepping into the unknown in a positive way, letting go of fear, letting go of preconception, letting go of judgment, all the things that keep the mind and the spirit small. And you put those aside and you step into limitlessness and this larger world, and in that world, is where creativity happens. Creativity is an enlarging of the self and, uh, and, uh, and a stepping into the unknown always. So I think that is a key element for me. All the different changes in my style came about because I was willing to step into and go in a new direction and discover new things. Um, and so you slowly, slowly enlarge the base of what you know by going into what you don't know and you slowly, slowly enrich yourself that way. And that is the process of life. It can go on indefinitely. We can go on growing and growing and growing indefinitely. And that, I think, is the duty of the artist, to continue to grow always. You know, in some ways, to be a good portraitist, you have to have almost a gambler's mentality because it's such a gamble. And you're, you're under pressure because the subject is right there. And you're inviting that person into your creative process. Um, and of course it can go wrong and you and those mistakes are then exposed to the subject so portraiture is a very immediate uh, branch of the visual arts personally I think it's one of the most fascinating branches of painting I mean when I was a kid I was always fascinated by that phenomenon you get when you look at a, a good portrait and the eyes seem to follow you around the room you know I thought as a kid, I was like, how is this possible that I feel like this picture is alive, is following me around the room? And I, that really st always stayed with me, this idea that, that, that even though it's just two dimensions, the, the genius of the artist has been able to capture consciousness. That entity is alive. And it's still a form of magic, which I find beguiling. And um, it's why I will always do portraits. I mean, even though I'll do other branches in art and so on, I have done, I'll always come back to portraiture because it's about the essential human mystery, capturing the essential, essential human mystery, which I think is unknowable. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think science, with all of its genius, will ever understand the nature of the human self because it's a sacred mystery. It will always be a sacred mystery. And that's, when I paint portraits, that's what I... I want to capture that. Everybody has a, a self that is presentable, that they have curated and created for public consumption, and they all ha also have a self which is private and I think a, a more real. Uh, and usually that's, that private self is the one that's uh, a little more in pain, shall we say, a little more torment, a little more plugged into the reality of life. The tension between these two selves, between the mask, if you will, and, and the deeper self is really interesting to me. And in, in a portrait painting, um, I'm always aware of those two selves, especially when you're painting a celebrity, because a celebrity is somebody who, by necessity, has formed a good public persona. And yet, if you believe all of the spiritual texts of the world and all of the religious texts, which I do, we are all, if you go to the source of every human being, we are all one consciousness, whether it be a plumber, a street sweeper, or a great writer. If you go to the core of every human being, you will find 
pure consciousness, pure awareness, which is divine. And that's really interesting too, too because even though every time I do a portrait, I'm painting a different face and a different person, I'm always, I think, trying to paint that one essential self in everybody. And when I capture it, it is a self that's usually at peace. It accepts life. It accepts the difficulty of life, the pain of life, because it's all powerful. There used to be this belief, and there still is in ancient hunter-gatherer cultures, that when you kill the beast, you take the beast's power into yourself, you know. Uh, the American Indians had this, uh, this attitude to the buffalo. They, when they looked upon the buffalo, they didn't just see the, this great animal, but they also saw the spirit of the buffalo. And when the young brave kills the buffalo, he takes into himself this manhood, essentially. So when I was painting these big personalities, you know, Oliver Stone and Gore Vidal and Dominic Dunn and so on, I felt that as a young painter, I was somehow taking in their power. Every time I captured them, captured them, I was like capturing the beast and I was taking it. So I went through a phase in my early career where I needed to, feel, I needed to increase my sense of personal power. And so I painted these men that fr I was frightened of them. I mean, I was frightened of them. They were all very well established. They had these big egos, great talents. And here am I, this young kid, you know, with my brush and my easel. And I pushed myself through a barrier of fear to do those pictures. And I'm glad I did because it, it, it gave me a sense of, again, this idea of, of going into the unknown, not being afraid. You know, I love... Um, I love this idea that daring, true daring, is never fatal. And there's also another phrase that I love. I think it's a Chinese proverb. It says, when, f when fate raises its sword to make you tremble, go forth into it and you will find bliss. Wow. It makes sense that the treasure, the true treasure in life is protected by dragons, by really scary stuff. Only people who are really willing to go into their fear deserve to find that treasure. You know, and artists always go in. Uh, we are, we're all drawn to relationship. We're drawn to go into relationship, I think, because when we're in relationship, we, we see ourselves in the eyes of the other person. We get back a mirror image of ourselves, which is different from the self we know. I think if you're in a good relationship, the person mirrors back to you good things about yourself, but also things about yourself that you can't see. Um, and, but in a loving way uh, that says, okay, I love this about you, but this about you, maybe this can change and so on. So we're drawn into relationship because we need the portrait of ourselves. Um, and it's the only way that we get a sense of ourselves because the mirror just gives us the mirror image. Often the photograph just gives us uh, a rendition of light falling on the face in, three, uh, in two dimensions. Uh, but the portrait is a, uh, is a human being looking at another human being through the apparatus of their nervous system with their heart and everything. So you really see yourself through the eyes of another human being. And that is revelatory in the best sense. Um, it can also be very damaging because if that person who sees you deeply makes a judgment that's very negative, they can hurt you very, very deeply as well. But what I'm saying is the, the activity, the dynamic of portraiture is in all human relationship. And we, we crave it because we, cra we naturally crave information about ourselves. Yeah? And we ourselves do, cannot see ourselves from every angle from every dimension. We just can't. We don't have that kind of... So we rely on others to complete our sense of self. As a portrait painter, an artist is in a strange position because artists have big egos. I mean, you do have a big ego, uh, but you don't have a big false self. You have a big real self in the sense that you have a lot that you want to say and you feel that what you have to say is important. So when you put yourself in a subservient position to the person you're going to paint, because in a sense, that what, that's what the portraitist does. The portraitist is, is there in the subservient position to the subject. The subject is being painted and celebrated and captured. Um, 
And sometimes that can chafe. You can feel it, wait, you know, and that's why you do self-portraits. That's why, you know, it's important to do the self-portraits because then you use the paint and the whole creative process to celebrate yourself. If I was to paint Gore now, uh, 26 years later, um, I think I would probably be, it would maybe be a more interpretive painting, maybe a bit looser, maybe a bit more experimental because I have more confidence in my technique than I did then. Not that I don't like that picture. I like that picture very much that I did of him, but it has a level of precision uh, that was, I think, something in me was still proving myself. I was still proving myself as a painter who could do, who could create this level of precision and likeness and clarity in a painting. Nowadays, I'm less um, preoccupied with, with that. You, you prove yourself. You're in your, you have to, at the beginning, you have to prove yourself, or at least you feel you do. And that's entirely, that makes sense. Because technique is very important. Technical proficiency is terribly important for, for freedom. It's only when you get to a certain level of technical mastery that you feel free to step away from it and fly. You know, I don't subscribe to this view. Young artists want to be free immediately, you know? No, 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 it won't work because the work will just flop like a plant that doesn't have a, t you know, a stick to grow up. You know, technique is the stick that allows the plant to slowly wind up to the light. And then at a certain point, you can let the stick go and flower. But you, you, you've got to develop discipline, technique, mastery, which only comes through repetition and very, very hard work. I mean, art is incredibly hard work. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's Franz Kafka. He says this wonderful thing, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, if when you met somebody for the first time, you sensed the reality of that person, you would go down on one knee, and you would hang your head and say, I, I, I bend the knee to you, to the experiences to, that you've had, to the childhood you've been through, because in every person you meet, you are meeting a huge world, this huge story of their experience. It's vast. It's very, very powerful. And as a portrait painter, I think maybe a little more than most people, when I meet somebody new, I sense the magnitude of their experience. And I naturally have reverence for it. And I'm naturally slightly in awe of it. I'm in awe of every human being because of what we have each individually been through. Extraordinary. Just childhood. Just take childhood up to the age of 12. It's an enormous journey. It's astonishing. Infinite. So when you come across somebody in their 70s, 80s, now, you know, I mean, it's like, it's, it's the, 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 the layering is fascinating. So, uh, yeah. I am very, very, very interested in human beings. You know, that's all I can say. That's, that's where I start from as, as, a, as a portrait painter. Last night I was lying on the bed with my baby, three and a half months old, she was sleeping, and I was watching her sleep, and I thought in this moment that I'm looking at her, her entire life, this moment of her life is connected to her entire life to come. Everybody she'll meet, uh, the children, her experiences, everything is in this package, this one moment. Obviously, because if, if, if there were any injury done to her in that moment, that life would disappear. Do you know what I'm saying? So everything depends on this. As I talk to you now, I am connected to the rest of your life, the rest of your experience. Um, as you say, that's huge. But if we lived our lives according to that understanding, that reality, we wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. We wouldn't be able to go out to the supermarket, right? Because we'd be over, so overwhelmed by information. So there's a part of the brain that closes down the aperture, really closes down the aperture, really small, so that we only take in essential information so we can get on with our life. Uh, as a painter, when I come into the portrait situation, I open that aperture up. I selectively open the aperture up. To take, in, to take in this larger amount of information. I mean, my, my, my daughter is now, is the center of my existence. I mean, it, so, so it shifts your center of existence. I mean, my work is incredibly important to me. My work is everything. 
Um, uh, but um, I, I, if, if anything happened to the connection I have with my daughter, I would not be able to work. It would sever that. So she is now at the very core of my reality, my existence. So that, that's a fundamental shift in who I am. Some people would say that artists shouldn't have children because it gets in the way of the kind of degree of self-involvement and selfishness that you need to do good work. But I'm not so sure that's true. I mean, maybe when you're young, a younger artist, it can get in the way when you're establishing yourself. But as you get older, I think you need to experience that sense of the child, not your inner child, but this child here being the center. And it's a kind of love that is unique. And art ultimately comes from love. I mean, I, you know, I, I really think art is a form of love because the, the, the level of care, attention to detail, tenderness, depth perception that you have to generate as an artist is akin to love. I mean, when I'm doing a painting and it's going well and I feel like I'm capturing the person, I literally fall in love. I mean, I remember I was doing a, a drawing of, of a lady in New York and as the, as the drawing started to come good, I wanted to say, I, I mean, it came up and I almost said, I love you. I'd never met the woman before. It was the first sitting. But there was something about that moment of capturing her that I, I wanted to tell her that I really loved her. <laughs> because, so so it's, it, is, it is a kind of, it is love. Art, art and creativity is, is a loving act. Again, I mean, I, I think, all creatives are, uh, you know, there's the creative core, there's the creative center, and it can go into dance, painting, photography, it can go into business, you can become a very creative entrepreneur, it can go in many different directions, that essential creativity. And, you know, I mean, maybe I could have been other things other than an artist, uh, other than a painter. I mean, uh, I mean, I think in some ways my creativity is quite adaptable because I write as well and I teach and I sculpt and um, some people are more distinct in where their creativity wants to go. I mean, there are, th there are two, two ways to go with a, a, a portrait nowadays. There's the portrait that is created from life only, where the subject is with you for the whole process which is a very deeply involved process. And then there's a portrait which sometimes is done completely from photographs. And then there's a third kind of portrait which is done from life sittings initially and then photographs. Working from photographs, increasingly portraitists work from photographs, more and more, because people are very busy now. They don't have time to sit. Um, so, portraitists have to work from photographs, which is a, a blessing and a tragedy. I mean, the nice thing about a photograph is that all the information is fixed. It's already been turned into two dimensions for you, so much work has already been done. Um, the problem is, because it's fixed, you can obsess over it, getting it exactly right, and often you end up with a painting that looks like a photograph. I mean, if you go to a, a lot of these portrait uh, competitions now, you go and you see that a, at least three quarters of the work in there is done from photography. So it's changing the way we do portraits. If you go back to the original way of doing the portrait, which is exclusively from life, which I think is very important, then that's a deeper transaction. You see the person over days, you see how the person changes, and they do begin to change you. It becomes a much deeper transaction. And inevitably, every relationship you have of any depth changes you. It gives to you or it can take, depending on whether it's positive or, or negative. Um, I think as you get older, you learn to identify people who are gonna take from you soon. And you say, thank you very much, I think I'll go over here. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it can be quite draining. Yes. Very, the most, it's the, you know, it's very, very draining. Um, one must be very careful about who you let in. Yeah, I remember a friend of mine who was a painter 
and I th she was at school in London in a, at a very good art school and she was painting and she had some opera music playing and the art tutor came up and said what are you doing she said well I'm doing a painting she said no no why are you listening to music he said do not listen to music when you paint it inspires grandiosity and I thought wow like grandiosity is a bad thing in painting. Um, so I was very aware from early days because I had a lot of friends who were painters and I loved their work and then they went to art school and I didn't like their work anymore. Something happened. And so I made a conscious decision as I, at the beginning that I wouldn't go to art school. It didn't make sense to me that anybody should teach me how to be an artist because as far as I was concerned the art the artist road is so solitary it's about finding your unique your unique voice which is unique to your soul I mean uh, you know God did God did not create us equal God created us unique it's different um, and to discover our uniqueness is the great quest in life and it's sometimes very, very difficult to find your way all the way down to your uniqueness and say, yeah, that is me. That is uniquely me. Nobody else inhabits that space but me. Whenever you do a piece of work, the process, the creative process of the piece of work is getting rid of what is not genuine, what's not true. Layers, skin, you know, you, you shed all the skin and you want to get down to the essential kernel of the image that is you uniquely your gift speaking and that's when when you see a picture like that when you see a painting like that it's like a voltage because that person that artist has gone all the way to the source of themselves and that's very powerful there's there's a tendency when you're young to feel that when you get rejected which is completely natural and normal uh, when you encounter rejection and when you encounter resistance as an artist you think there's something wrong um, but it's you should encounter rejection and resistance if you're original. The more original you are, the more resistance you will encounter. That's just the way it is. Um, because you don't fit into any preconceived boxes. An original human being with original energy comes into the world and the world has never seen that before. It doesn't know how to deal with it. And so naturally it resists criticizes, it's try, it, it doesn't want to handle it. So the, so the unique talent has to drive, drive, drive through all of that resistance, all of that critique until they get to a point where they, are, where they can materialize their uniqueness in the world, which is difficult because the world doesn't want that. Very difficult. I mean, for instance, the famous story of Laurence Olivier, possibly the greatest actor ever, he only developed stage fright when he was in his 50s. Up to then, he never experienced stage fright. Uh, Picasso famously, even when he was in his 60s, uh, he would wake up depressed every morning because he thought Matisse was a better painter. You know, and so uh, Jacqueline or whoever his lover was at the time had to talk him, no, Pablo, you are actually the greatest artist living, you know, and he, he didn't believe it. So uh, you, I don't think any artist ever gets to the point where they're like, good, where they're like, no more fear, no more doubt. That never goes away. In fact, I think the older you get and the more your sensibility becomes attuned, the more information you can take in, take in the more you are susceptible to doubt, in a way. Um, and doubt keeps you pliant. It keeps you soft. It keeps you subtle. One should never banish doubt because then you become an egomaniac. You know, these are the dangerous people, the, the, the people who never have doubt, who never question themselves, who just, you know. So the stress associated with doubt uh, never goes away in, in the artist's life. And you do, I suppose, in some ways have to like it feel stimulated by it. It's your caffeine, you know. Uh, every time you go and you sit down to the portrait, it's, it's the unknown again, it could go wrong, you know. Um, 
It's like getting in an, uh, an airplane. Every time you get in an airplane, there's the, I mean, do you, you know, do you become, you know, there's always that possibility that this is your last flight. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry, but, you know, there, there's always the possibility in the artist's mind that, okay, this is the painting where, the, well, where they will find me out, where everybody will see that I can't paint anymore. I've, I've managed up to this point to convince everybody, but this is the point. Imposter syndrome. And yes, imposter syndrome. Exactly. That never goes away. Uh, uh, the, the Samuel Beckett. <laughs> the, the yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But he said, uh, Samuel Beckett, the playwright, he said, art is fidelity to failure, which I think is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely, because you, you dive in. You dive in, and, for, and when you first dive in to all this information, you're, you're struggling to stay. It's like you're drowning in all this so much information, so much material. And, you have, and, then, and then something clicks together. It's like when I do a portrait. I dive in, there's so much information in the face. The pen, the brush is going around and around and around. And then suddenly, the nostril and the eye, that locks. The nostril and the eye are in the right alignment. And the whole portrait forms around that kernel. That's correct. That's what you're talking about. Uh, it's it's a, a crystallizing moment because the work is a big crystal and it's the first moment where there's a, the first crystal forms and then all the other crystals form around that center. And that's what you're looking for. But until you get that crystallizing moment, you're in a state of extreme anxiety. You feel like you're, you're falling, like you're drowning. And it's frightening. It goes with performance because every creative act is a performance you're going out you're exposing yourself you're exposing your vulnerability your sensitivity all the things which people normally protect and hold close because they don't want to be hurt but the artist turns himself inside out and all of that sensitive stuff is externalized and uh, so it is frightening um, but the, the thing that's so enriching about coming across art is that you experience the other person's internal reality. You're, you, you're so grateful that that person has shown themselves to you. Uh, there are a lot of people in the art world who are, who are critical and they feed off the courage of artists to expose themselves and they, you know, they, they fire a lot of negative criticism. Um, but that's their problem. The bottom line is that the creative act is a performative act, and the performer is courageous. The performer goes out on stage and exposes the part of themselves that normally everybody keeps private. It's perverse. It is a form of perversion. It's a form of exhibitionism. My need to show you what's inside. You know, it's crazy, even. You know, and so there is anxiety associated with it normally, but we have to share this information. This is part of what it is to be human beings. You look at the rest of the animal kingdom, you don't see, even amongst higher primates, you don't see them really sharing these internal, because the thing that makes us unique as a creature, as an animal, is that we build up these enormous interior realities. We're the only animal that does that. And then we have to share these, all of this internal reality with each other. We have to. That's part of being human, but it's, it's, it's frightening. I mean, to my mind, there's that painting, the painting in the, my book, Tragedy and Comedy, and the two, the, the face of comedy and the face of tragedy are joined together like Siamese twins. For me, you know, tragedy and comedy are part of the same wavelength. Um, Woody Allen, I think, said uh, comedy is tragedy plus time. Um, so, yeah, um, I think if I'd maybe been more interested in comedy, I might have gone on stage rather than into painting, maybe. The, 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 the one thing to add, I think, about the unknown is that you have to have a sense of guidance. You have to have an instinctive, a strong gut and a strong instinct. If you're going to go into the unknown, you have to feel that you're, you have a guide and, but that guide is not rational. It's uh, super rational. And that's when, they, when somebody says, oh, that person's gifted. 
what they're really saying is that person has a guide to take them into the unknown. And we have various words for what the guide is, but the best word is genius, because the original word, the original meaning of genius is the guide. And in the famous poem, The Divine Comedy, where Dante goes down into, into Inferno in order to get to Paradiso, Virgil, the poet, the, the Latin poet Virgil, is his guide, is his genius that takes him through. So the guide is terribly important. And I believe that we all have the guide. We all have it. But whether it's turned on or not is, is, the, is the difference. And the consciousness you're talking about, this what I call um, uh, supraconsciousness or superconsciousness, is the only thing that will save the planet. It's the only thing that will save the human project. Otherwise, we will destroy ourselves. It's quite so artists download that into the world and we need to keep downloading it and downloading it and bringing it down and in because you know, it's the only thing that can solve the problems.